chapter 1, Luke 1, and we're going to start in verse 5, Luke 1, in verse 5. What we're going to do tonight is uh, we're going to go somewhere, and we're going to pray here at the end and uh, just agree together for each other, for this region, for the city as the Lord leads. But I want to talk to you about two of my heroes in the Bible named Zechariah and Elizabeth. And what we're going to do is we're going to walk through these passages and really the chapter one of Luke, and we're going to kind of break it down bit by bit. I want to share a word with you tonight about faith lessons from the lives of Zechariah and Elizabeth. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the division of Abia. His wife was of the daughters of Aaron. Her name was Elizabeth. They were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren and they were both well advanced in years. So it was that while Zacharias was serving as priest before God, In the order of his division, according to the custom of the priesthood, his lot fell to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of the people was praying outside at the hour of incense. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard. That's some good news right there. And your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son. You shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel, to the Lord their God. He will also go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Lord, we ask you to bless your word tonight. We ask you to speak to the hearts of your people, encourage them, edify them, exhort them, comfort them, God. Do what only you can do. We believe for miracles tonight. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. The first thing we see about this couple is it begins to kind of give them creditation. It begins to talk about what they have done that's been amazing. Both Zacharias and Elizabeth, the Bible tells us that they were both righteous before God, walking in all of his commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. It just begins to talk about this life that they've lived all their life. Man, they've been righteous before God. They've been blameless. They've kept His Word. But right after that, it gives us another sentence. And the sentence starts off like this, but they had no child. You know, the word but in Greek is very interesting. It means to zero out. You know, if I'm, I'm looking at my buddy Jake here, Jake's honor, and and I'm I'm, I'm telling, Jake's awesome. Jake's amazing. But how many know what I'm about to say is what really matters? And when the Bible is saying they had done all these things, but they had no child. Have you ever felt like you were doing everything God told you to do, but you were barren? Okay, just me. You were doing everything you knew to do. You were keeping, you were in obedience. You're righteous before God through Jesus Christ. There are all these things you're reading, you're praying, you're doing everything you know to do. But where's the fruit? Where's the manifestation of his promises? Where's the breakthrough that he promised me? And if we get honest tonight, here's Zacharias and Elizabeth living before God. They're not living for the promise. They're not living for the manifestation. But they know what he's said. They know what he's promised. And here they are in, in, in their lives. But they had no child. 
As we walk through, we see that they didn't have a child for really two major reasons. Number one, Elizabeth is past the age of childbearing. She couldn't have children if she wanted to. She's an older woman. But not only that, but when she could have kids, she was diagnosed with the condition. She was barren. And even when they tried in their youth, it was to no avail. And all of her life, this seemed to hang over her. We're serving you, God. We're obeying you, God. We're righteous before you, God. But somewhere in their heart, they're going, but where is your promises? Where is the manifestation of what you said to us? Am I talking to anyone tonight? So it was that while Zacharias was at priest, a day comes and they cast lots. And his lot is about burning incense. You know, Revelation, I believe it's 5.8, talks about that incense represents the prayers of the saints. Here we see a people that in the midst of serving God, obeying God, that they've never stopped contending. They've never stopped believing. They've never stopped praying. And that's what I would want to say to you tonight. That if you're that person that says, I'm doing everything I know to do. But there's no manifestation. I'm telling you tonight, don't stop praying. The first thing we see about Zacharias was he was a man of prayer. He was going to burn incense. He was going to go before God and offer up to God something from his heart. But not only that, the Bible says that outside, verse 10, a whole multitude of people were praying outside. Not only do you need to be a person of prayer, not only do you need to continue to contend, even when you don't see the promises of God, you need to get in a community of prayer. What about that scripture in the Bible where two of you agree is touching anything on earth, it shall be done for you. There's something that Jesus promises us that you can't get on your own. You, he has made it necessary for us to get in community and pray together in order to see some things manifest. There's some things he's not going to allow you to get on your own. And here's Zachariah saying, I choose to be a man of prayer in the midst of the brokenness and the barrenness. And where's the fruit? Where's the manifestation? I'm going to be a person of prayer. But not only that, I'm going to connect myself to a community of people. And that's what the ramp is about. We pray about when we're going to pray, right? We do pre-service prayer. We're praying all the time. Why? Because that's what this thing is about. It's amazing when we get to do conferences and things like that. And we'll be in the green room and we'll be praying, whether it's in here or in Hamilton. And we'll be praying and we'll be praying. And then we walk out and we watch unfold everything we just prayed about. And, and, and we, we, didn't get to, uh, we didn't get to speak in the service. We didn't lead that service. We were just a people that prayed. But there's something about a culture of prayer that when you connect yourself to it, miracles are inevitable. But that's not where it stops. Not only do you need to be a person of prayer, not only do you need to be in the community of prayer, but when the angel shows up, he says, Zacharias, your prayer is heard. You need to have a deep-seated conviction that God hears prayer. Do you believe when you pray, you're being heard? Or do you walk away going, I hope that worked? Anybody ever prayed those kind of prayers, right? You walk away going, well, we'll see. We'll, we'll hope that works. No, hope don't float, Right? No, you've got to believe. You've got to have a conviction. You've got to know that when the righteous cry out, the Lord hears. That the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man, it, what, it avails much. No, God does hear his people when they pray. And if we pray, he will answer. You know, last time we were here, we preached about not giving up. And I talked to you guys about the definition of insanity, right? The, the world's got a definition of insanity, right? To do the same thing over and over and over again and expect different results, right? And, and that does apply, right? Some of us, that's cheesecake. Right? We got the COVID-40, right? You know what I mean? I, I believe in God to get in shape. No, you ain't getting in shape as long as you, you're eating that, brother. You know what I mean? It ain't happening, right? That's insane. You're, you're thinking insane, 
But there are kingdom principles that absolutely ask you to do the same thing over and over again and expect different results. Even when you don't see anything, keep on asking and it will be given. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and you will get the door open. There are things in Christianity that Zacharias and Elizabeth understood under the covenant they had with God. We've not seen a manifestation. We've been barren all our lives. We have lived before you, but we will not stop contending because he was a man of prayer in a community of prayer with a deep-seated conviction. God will hear me when I pray. And what unfolds is nothing short of amazing. I mean, Gabriel shows up, right? I mean, I mean, it's one thing to have an angelic encounter. It's another thing for the head guy to show up, right? Gabriel shows up, and he's like, you're going to have a kid, and his name is John. And then he unpacks the magnitude of his ministry. You're going to have joy. You're going to rejoice at his birth. He's going to be great in the sight of the Lord. He's going to be a Nazarite. He's going to be filled with the Holy Ghost. And he's going to turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He's going to go before him, capital H, he's talking about Jesus, in the spirit and power of Elijah. He's going to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. He's going to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. He shows up and talks about the magnitude of the answer of this prayer. He's going to get an entire nation ready for Jesus. I don't think we get the magnitude of John's impact. If there wasn't a John, there would have never been a Jesus. Did you catch that? John had to prepare the way. Read the Old Testament. Read the prophetic words about him. John prepared the way. He prepared an entire people for one guy, for the guy. John's, you know, I think it was Josephus who wrote about John the Baptist. Tens of thousands showing up to repent and get baptized. It was a national revival. This guy changed a nation and eventually the world. His impact was so great. And here's where the enemy would want to deceive you. Because you think, I feel this, you think your delay is a denial. You think the prayer not being answered is God saying no. When it's in reality, it's a delay. It's not a denial. And the delay has only been about the magnitude of the answer this thing's going to be. Come on, somebody. This thing is so big, it's just going to take a little time to cook. You're not going to put the pot roast in the microwave, friend. It ain't going to be good. It's going to be like rubber. Put it in the crock pot and give it some time. Right? I'd said this before. We're a microwave people who serve a crock pot God, right? You know what I mean? I want it now. This thing's got to cook, baby. It would be crazy for someone who just took a pregnancy test and found that they were pregnant to come to the altar tonight and say, pray for this baby to be delivered. Do we have counselors in the house? Please come. Come now. Help this young lady. Right? We would look at her strange because we understand there's a preparation to this. There's a growth to this. There's a development to this. And there are things that have been delayed in your life. And all your life you're going, God, where's it at? Where's the manifestation? You said it, God. You've been delayed. But your delay is not a denial. And if we're not careful, the enemy steps into moments of delay. And he prays upon it. P-R-E-Y-S, he prays upon it. And he sows seeds of doubt and unbelief. And like Eve, we listen to the subtle serpent and go, did God really say? Did he really promise us that? In the moment of encounter, there was no denial. You wrote it in your journal, you dated it in everything. But now, years later, did God really say? 
And I'm here to prophesy to you tonight, your delay is not a denial. Your delay has been about the magnitude. John, let me tell you about, he didn't say, he didn't just say you're going to have a kid. That would have been wonderful. That shouted ground enough. You're just going to have a kid. No, let me tell you about your boy. He's going to turn a nation. He's going to make ready a people prepared for the. He's going to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to the disobedient, the, the disobedient to the wisdom and the just. He, he, he told him the very last verse in Malachi. The very last verse in your Old Testament is that. He said, this God's going to fulfill it. This thing's big. This thing's really big. And some of you, it's been waiting because it's been so big. Anybody receive it? Listen to this. I got a warning in here for you. And Zechariah said to the angel, how shall I know this? I'm an old man. My wife is well advanced in years. And then Gabriel gets a little mad. And the angel answered and said, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. And I was sent to speak to you and bring you these glad tidings. But behold, you will be mute. And not able to speak until the the day these things take place. Because you didn't believe it. You didn't believe the words which would be fulfilled in their own time. See, this is the enemy's job. Your delay, he steps into and sows those seeds of doubt and unbelief. And if you're not careful, God's still going to step in and do it. But if you're not careful, you can abort the very promise that he said he's going to come to fulfill. He had to make him mute. Your words, death and life, are in the power of your tongue, Zacharias. I'm telling you, you have prayed about this and I'm about to do it and you can't even believe it. And if we're not careful, we're going to curse the very thing that God wants to do still. Joshua, he knew what it was like for people's mouth to get him in trouble. He was in the wilderness with the rest of them. And so when he finally gets to go into the promised land, he said, we're going to follow what God said, but don't none of y'all say anything. Because he said, your fathers got us in trouble because of their mouth. They aborted the very promise God was going to give them. And if we're not careful, this delay, instead of staying in a place of faith, you'll get in a place of doubt and unbelief. And your mouth can short circuit and abort the very promise they want, God wanted to give you. And, jo- and Joshua just said this. He said, when you finally do say something, just yell, just holla. Right? Just, ah! Don't even try to say words. Because we're not ruining this thing that God is wanting to provide for us. Are you with me? And the people waited for Zacharias and marveled that he lingered so long in the temple. He comes out. They see this. They're amazed. Verse 23, so it was as soon as the days of his service was completed, he departed to his own house. And listen to this. After those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and she hid herself five months, saying, Thus the Lord has dealt with me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among people. Some of you have held that reproach because you've not seen the promise fulfilled. There's been a shame over you. There's been a guilt over you. There's been this hidden God that you do what you said you would do in you. And God is saying, I'm going to show up and I'm going to do everything I told you I would do. Because you continued to pray. Because you got in a culture of prayer. Because you had a conviction that I hear prayer. And I'm going to show up on your behalf and remove your Reproach. Now, here's what's crazy. This happens six months later, and we'll see this in the timeline when you read the story. Same chapter, Gabriel now shows up to Mary. 
he shows up to this 14, 15, 16-year-old girl. He begins to do almost the same thing. Yet Mary's journey is a little different. She's young in the Lord, not having the age and experience that Zacharias and Elizabeth had, but she's been seen and chosen by God to carry something of significance. The angel begins to give her the promise. The child, you're going to have a child. God's going to put his word in you, the seed of the word of God, and you're going to conceive a child without knowing a man. He's going to be the son of God. He's going to sit on the throne of his father David. He's going to reign forever. What a promise. What a promise. But the angel does something that I think is very interesting. And this is what it says, verse 36. He tells her about the promise. He tells her how he's going to do it. The power, the Holy Spirit's going to come upon you. The power of the highest will overshadow you. And in verse 36, he does something interesting. He tells her a testimony. The angel tells Mary a testimony. And I, I almost feel like we miss this part of the conversation. He tells her this impossible thing. Now we know what her response is going to be, right? Behold, be it unto me according to your word. We know what Mary's going to respond. But he's got to get her faith there. Because we saw what happened with Zacharias. His faith just couldn't grasp it, it seemed. So he said, I'm just going to have to strike you mute so you don't abort this thing with your doubt and unbelief. So here's Mary. And he tells her the magnitude of what God's going to do through her life. And then he tells her testimony. He says, you know what? Your relative Elizabeth's pregnant. He said, it's now her sixth month of pregnancy for the one who is called barren. And then he gives a little tagline of truth. For with God, Mary, nothing is impossible. I'm amazed that an angel told a testimony. He shows up. You're going to burst something that's going to change the world, Mary. How can this be? I've never known a man. Holy Spirit's going to come on you. The power of the highest is going to overshadow you. And let me tell you a testimony real quick to build your faith. Your Aunt Elizabeth, she's pregnant. And Mary's going, what? She knows Elizabeth. She knows that she's old and she's past the age of childbearing. She knows that when she was able to have children, they had difficulty. She knows the story. So when the angel shows up and says, she's having a baby, Mary's faith jumps. And I just picture it. Lord, be it unto me according to your word. You know what's amazing about this? There are Zacharias's and Elizabeth's in here that God's going to do a miracle for you. I've come to announce tonight your delay is not a denial. That he's going to keep every promise that he's given you. The instruction he wanted to give to you tonight was don't stop praying. Don't stop believing. Thank you, Journey. Right? Get in the community of people of prayer. Have a firm conviction. God answers prayer. But your testimony, Elizabeth, of God doing something impossible for you is meant to be shared with the generation that's coming up. Because when they hear what God did through you, and did for you, something's going to jump in their heart called faith, and they're going to be the very ones that birthed something that changed this world. Don't belittle your story. Don't short-circuit your story. Don't jump ship because there's been a delay. No, friend, stay in faith and let God do the impossible through you. Why? Because the story of what he did through me and for me is meant to be a, a faith of a merry generation that's coming. And they're going to burst some things that open blind eyes. They're going to burst some things that redeem humanity. They're going to burst some things that give lame people feet again. And people who need new hearts a new heart. They're going to do things that are unbelievable. But why did they do it? Because they heard your story. Come on, give God praise right there. In the Passion Translation... 
It actually says this in the footnote. It says, Zacharias, the prayers that you no longer pray, I'm answering. For some of you, it's been so long you stopped praying about it. You stopped contending for it. You just said, you know what, I guess that just wasn't the Lord. And you gave up on it. But I want to tell you tonight that even the prayers that some of you have stopped praying, God is going to resurrect it in your heart. God is going to do it for you to show you that he is true to his word. Can I get an amen? It was Christmas of 2000, and I was a a very lukewarm Christian. I was 17 years of age and just came on our Christmas break in my senior year. On the Christmas break, I was in my bedroom one night, and I cried out to the Lord. I said, Jesus, I just want to know that you're real. I know, I've heard that you can change lives. I need you to change my life. I had a radical encounter with Jesus that night in my bedroom. After that, I just sold out to the Lord. I gave it all. It confronted everything. We all thought we had Jesus, right? We all went to church. We all prayed the prayers and sang the hymns and did the motions. But day to day, we didn't have a walk with God. And all of a sudden, here's a 17-year-old boy praying in his bedroom, reading his Bible all the time, wanting to go to every church service possible, where before I was just trying to get out of any church service that was happening. So it confronted everyone in my family. My younger brother jumped on board. He began to burn for Jesus. I saw it touch my mom and my older brother, but dad was not having it. Dad was a little more stubborn. Dad was a little more resistant. My dad had some serious medical conditions in his life. My dad at that point was disabled. I won't go into the whole story of it tonight, maybe another time. But my dad in 1988 had surgery that went wrong. It damaged both of his lungs to the point that my dad had to wear an oxygen tank by the time we got into the 1990s, almost 24-7 just to breathe. About 30% of his lungs were operational. Because of this, my dad began to get into depression. When my dad did attend church, he usually fell asleep during the service. But I watched my father just sliding and sliding and sliding farther and farther from life and from God himself. I, after getting touched by the Lord at the Christmas of 2000, in March of 2001, I was invited to a youth retreat. So I decided to go at the last second. I ended up going on this youth retreat. At this point, I was just grateful I was going to heaven, right? I was great. I disconnected from my friends, and I was just grateful that I wasn't living in sin anymore, and I was clean, and I was living for God the best I knew how, but the idea of reaching others did, did not really penetrate me. And here I am at this youth retreat, and they we're on the last night, last service. They show this cheesy youth video, right? That's what they do at youth retreats. This is 2001. They're showing something from the 1980s. They're, the kids in the video are driving a station wagon. It's, it's God-awful. Please pray for youth ministry, right? So we watched this video, and in the video, as cheesy as it might sound, it, it would change my life forever. They, they just won a state championship in basketball, and so all these kids get in this station wagon, and they're driving. They're hitting the town, and they come to this stop sign. The person in the driver's seat slams it in the in the park, and he yells, Chinese fire drill, and they all run around the car. First one in the driver's seat slams it back in the drive and takes off. Well, we all know what's about to happen, right? They get hit by a semi. Welcome to youth ministry, right? (laughs) Now they're standing before God in judgment, and all of them are condemned except for one. And the Lord is welcoming him into heaven. He says, you knew my son Jesus. And the friends begin to get irritated and upset and angry. Why did you ever tell us about Jesus? Why were you our friend and you never told us about Jesus? I'll tell you the truth. The Spirit of the Lord fell in that room. Youth pastor gave an altar call. People begin to get saved. People begin to rededicate their lives. But those who didn't do those two things, he said, pray for those that don't know Jesus. I don't think I've done this yet since I've sold out to the Lord. It's been about three months that I've been following Jesus. I remember getting on my knees 
and a folded chair, and it didn't take me long to realize who was in my life. They didn't know the Lord. Obviously, the friends I just disconnected from that I was partying with before I gave my life to Jesus. So I began to pray for them. But not only that, I thought about my dad. And I'm going, God, my dad doesn't know you. And for the first time in my life, I began to pray sincere, tearful, heartfelt prayers to God for my father. God, he doesn't know you. I pray for my dad. That night set a trajectory for my life. I read a book during that time that talked about prayer. And it just relit or kept that fire burning even brighter. I remember pounding the floor in my bedroom, praying for my dad, contending for my father. God, save my dad. Rescue my father. All the while, I'm watching his health continue to deteriorate. I'm watching him live in depression. Twenty Almost all day long, just watch TV, lay on his bed. I'm praying for him. I'm praying for him. Every now and then, I would get to talk to him, but it just didn't seem like things were penetrating. And then one day, everything changed. We were in our mainline denominational church on a Sunday morning. My pastor preached, as he did almost every Sunday, a message on salvation. And was to give an altar call. The majority of the time, no one answered. Because everyone was saved already. And this morning... When he gave the altar call, God began to deal with me to go forward. And I'm going, no, God, I'm not going forward. Now, I'm saved. I'm burning for God. He said, I want you to go up. I want you to rededicate your life. And I want you to tell him, because I was about to go to the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, just north of here. I want you to tell him, to tell everybody in the church, you're going to go to that school and you're going to turn it upside down for me. Jesus, you know where we're at, right? You know what I mean? We're so conservative. There's no raising hands. There's a few hymnals, and then we sit down, we get a sermon, an altar call, and get out by 12 so the roasts don't burn. If you make a move in that church, every eye is on you. So here I am, and, 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 and if you go to a church with pews, you know what I'm talking about. If you're not on the end, it's awkward getting out. So not only, uh, God is telling me to go forward. In this super conservative church, I'm not on the end, and my heart is beating. Anybody ever try to wrestle with God and lose, right? I'm going, God, don't let me do this to God. I'm begging God, right? And finally, I yield. God, okay, so excuse me, excuse me. You know, and everybody's looking already. And I walk that aisle. And in my church, the preacher stood at the front. You didn't answer the altar. You walked up to him. You shook his hand, and he asked you why you came up. Brian, why don't you come up this morning? I want to rededicate my life, Pastor, and I want to tell the people here today that I'm going to go to my school, and I'm going to impact it for Jesus. He would say, thank you, stand on the front pew, and let's see if anybody else comes. So I stand right there on the front pew, and little would I know when one little act of obedience was about to break open. Next thing that happens, my cousin steps out, Julianne. And Julianne comes down to the altar, and she gives her heart to Jesus for the first time in her life. And as far as I know, Julianne's still in church. She's still serving God and all of that. But that's not the greatest miracle, even though it is a great miracle, that I want to tell you about. All of a sudden, my dad who has his oxygen tank, puts his oxygen tank on. And he steps out, and he walks. And he walks right past the pastor and walks to the actual altar. My dad has a huge protruding belly and chicken legs. He's prone to fall often because of his health condition and because of his, his body. He has to have an, a deacon on each side of him to help him to his knee. I cannot believe what I'm seeing. I've never seen my dad pray in my life as far as I know. I've never seen my dad cry in my life as far as I know. I've never seen it. 
And here, he's answering the altar call and bypasses the whole process, bypasses the pastor, and kneels at this altar. And I watch as my dad comes back to Jesus in a radical way. The pastor stands up. This has not happened before or since. He stands up and says, I want everybody in the church at this altar. 200 people in a country church in the backwoods of Tennessee answer an altar call and come down to pray. Why? Because there was a 17-year-old boy that just kept praying. And when he saw no results, and when he saw no movement, and he had nothing but rejection, he kept praying and said, God, I know you're true to your word. And you want to do this more than I. I've just come to Cleveland tonight to encourage someone. Don't you give up. Don't you stop praying. Your delay is not a denial. No, this thing's going to be big. Let me say this. Talking about the bigness of it. Little would I know, a year later, my dad would pass away in his sleep. Little would I know, my dad would pass away in his sleep. And as I drove from Knoxville... To West Tennessee, when I got home, my mother said, I want you to speak at his funeral. I said, no, I'm not going to speak at his funeral. I said, I'll just cry the whole time. She said, no, I think this is what your dad would want. And I wasn't the main speaker. They had people to do all the things and give the message, but they brought me up. And at this point, I'm 18 years old. And my entire family's there, save maybe minus one or two, both sides of the family. And something comes over me, and I preach the gospel, and I give an altar call. I call people forward. Now, I, I you know, it, it, it was like I was watching someone, and people responded. Family members responded, because the magnitude of what God was going to do was bigger than just my dad. It was my cousin Julianne. It was an entire family. God wants to do big things. But don't you let the enemy come in right now and sow seeds of doubt and unbelief. And now that I've got a testimony as an Elizabeth, I can share to the next generation. I said, God will do the impossible for you. God will keep his word to you. And all of a sudden, faith jumps in their heart and they go, if God did it for him, God had birthed something through me that's going to change lives too. Let's stand to our feet. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Just lift your hands to the Lord right now. Thank you, Lord. He's breaking off right now, reproach off of someone in this room. Shame. Just, 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 you've almost become embittered because of the delay. You know, I believe, I believe God doesn't want us offended with each other, but I especially believe God doesn't want us offended with Him. And there are people that get offended at God because of the delay. There's something big that's happening here. This is bigger than just a child, John. This is going to be something that turns a nation back. It's going to take time. It's got a process. And I, I don't know who that is. Right there in your seat, receive freedom right now in Jesus' name. Release that offense that you've had towards God. That bitterness that you've had. Why, God? Why did you show up? Your journey's not over. Your story's not over. He's still going to answer the prayers that you stop praying. He's still going to come through. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray for that embittered soul. I pray right now, God, that forgiveness would flood their hearts. The assurance of your faithfulness, God, 
would flood their hearts. The Lord, in the time of delay, the enemy came and he sowed seeds of doubt and unbelief. They stopped believing, Lord, but tonight you've come to resurrect faith. You've come to resurrect hope. You've come to resurrect in their hearts that God, you keep your word. You're not a man that you should lie, nor the son of man that you should repent. If God said it, that it's right, that it's true. You declared in the book of Revelation that you are faithful and you are true. God, assure your people tonight that you will keep your word. Others of you have allowed the seeds of doubt to be sown in your heart and like Eve in the garden, you begin to ask the question, did God really say? Tonight we counter the spirit of doubt that has harassed you in the name of Jesus. I take authority over that spirit in Jesus' name. Come on, the Bible says that when Jesus saw the multitudes, he saw that they were harassed. They were harassed. And this spirit of doubt has come to harass you. But I break it off of you in the name of Jesus. I release fresh faith into your heart. Let faith arise. Let faith arise. Let discouragement go. Let doubt go. Let fear go in the name of Jesus. We thank you for it. There's Zacharias and Elizabeth in this room, and God has done the impossible already for you. It's time for you to get loud. It's time for you to testify to a younger generation the works of the Lord and declare what our great God has done for you. Because without your testimony, faith won't jump in their heart like it did for Mary. And I'm telling you, there's a generation behind you, Mama and Daddy, Grandma, Grandpa, that's meant to birth some things that are going to change the world. We're not going to be ashamed of what the Lord has done. God, I pray that you would begin to give the Zacharias and the Elizabeths in this room opportunity to share the word, to declare the greatness of our God to declare the works of the Lord to a generation that is to come. Thank you, Lord. There are Marys in this room, a younger generation. And here you are. And God is beginning to talk to you about what He wants to do through your life. The Bible says that He declares the end from our beginning. You're going to change the world. You're going to go to nations. You're going to be a father to the fatherless. You're going to rescue people from sex slavery. You're going to awaken a generation. You go, God, how can this be? How can this be? Holy Spirit is going to come upon you. But not only that, I'm going to put people in your life that are going to share their story. They're going to talk about their daddy at 17, when they were 17. When they pounded the floor of their bedroom and they're going to pray for their dad's salvation. And one day, in obedience, they're going to walk an aisle and they're going to watch God do everything in a moment. I pray tonight, let faith arise in this room. Let faith arise in this room. Come on, lift your hands right now. Come on, lift those hands right now. Thank you, Lord. Come on, let faith rise in this room right now. Thank you, Lord.
to challenge those in this room. The prayers that you no longer pray, Zacharias, I'm answering. What is it that you stopped asking God for because of disappointment? What is it that you stopped contending for because of the delay? Maybe it was the salvation of a loved one. Maybe it was breakthrough in a certain area. I don't know what it is. It could be a plethora of things. But tonight, I just want them to just play behind us. Let's just lift up the sound of the instruments right now. I want everyone to lift your hands. The Bible says that God's house be made a house of prayer. I want us to pray. Come on. Rather than just singing a song and repeating what Braden is singing tonight, I want you to express your heart. Come on. Begin to pray for that. Begin to pray. God, save my father. Come on. Save my brother. Save my sister. Come on. Thanksgiving's coming up. God, I'm asking for the salvation of my family. Come on. Maybe it's for your workplace. Come on. I pray for Brenda tonight. I pray for her deliverance. I know she's addicted to those pills. God, set her free. I pray again. God, I pray for financial breakthrough, God. Lord, I want to be blessed to be a blessing. Come on, what is it that you're contending for tonight? Come on, every hand raised, every voice. Lift it to Jesus. Come on, begin to pray. Gentry, if you guys would join me on the stage, Ashley and Gentry Brown, I want to ask something very vulnerable, and, and there might not be anyone in here, but there might be someone. I'm asking Ashley and Gentry to come, and time does not permit to share their story, but they battled through several miscarriages after they got married. Gentry found himself distraught. He found himself wanting to give up, saying, is there something wrong with me? Am I sterile? Am I ever going to have children? They eventually had their first son, and after him, had two more miscarriages. When they had their third child, they went into the doctor, and the doctor was like, you know, your body is rejecting this. But they stayed in faith, and God did a miracle for them. They got two beautiful baby boys now but if you're here tonight and I'm asking something very vulnerable I'm not, I'm not I'm not doing this to embarrass anyone but I want us to pray tonight but if you've dealt with some kind of barrenness in the area of children or maybe you want to stand in a gap for someone that you know and you say tonight whether that's the husband whether that's the wife or whether that's someone you want to stand in the gap for if you wouldn't mind, I want you to come and just stand at this altar with your hands raised. I want to pray for you tonight. I'm going to have Gentry and Ashley pray tonight. If you're watching online, you need a miracle. A miracle of fertility. A miracle to have a child. Come on. God gives families. God gives babies. He's not trying to keep babies from people. Come on. His command in the beginning. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Right there, stretch your hand to that computer screen. If you've got your phone, hold that phone up. Make it a point of contact tonight. God is going to give the barren womb families. Come on, let's stretch your hands to those that have come to this altar, those in this audience. Come on. If you're filled with the Holy Spirit, I want you to begin to pray in the Spirit right now. I'm going to ask Gentry and Ashley to step forward. I'm going to ask them to pray. 
And we're going to pray tonight for healing in bodies. We're going to pray tonight that God would give them families, that God would heal the barren womb, that He would heal men of whatever issue it might be in their body, that He's going to do a miracle tonight. Come on, stretch your hands and begin to pray with us. Father, I just come to you right now in in Jesus' name, and I just declare healing over every body in this room. I thank you, Lord, that you are opening up wombs right now in Jesus' name. I thank you, God, that you are healing ovaries right now in Jesus' name, that you are correcting fallopian tubes right now in Jesus' name, that uteruses are made whole in Jesus' name. I thank you, Father, that you give good gifts. I thank you that you are able to do miracles today. I thank you, Lord, that we can come to you in agreement right now in the name of Jesus for the healing power of Jesus to come over each person standing in this altar and watching online, believing in faith for a baby. We thank you, God, and we call them forth in Jesus' name. We thank you there are no more hindrances. There is no more delay. I thank you, God, that there will be no more miscarriages in the name of Jesus. I thank you, God, that you are bringing forth a new generation that is going to speak your word and claim that there is goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And I thank you, God, that we have faith to believe that you still do miracles today, Jesus, that you still heal bodies today, Jesus. We thank you that you paid for that on the cross and by faith we can receive it in Jesus' name. Heavenly Father, we thank you right now, God, that you are the creator. God, that you you spoke into existence creation, Lord. And I thank you, Lord, that, that you said you know us from us from the foundation of the earth, before the foundation of the earth, that you knew our name and you called us, God. So I thank you, Lord. I thank you that barrenness is broken in the name of Jesus. God, I say hearts come alive in the name of Jesus. Lord, I say that every broken thing, everything that you thought you were lost, God is faithful and he's able to restore it in Jesus' name. God, I thank you for the multitudes, Lord. Say hey. Thank you, Jesus. God, I declare barrenness be broken, Lord. Generational barrenness be broken. Lord, I thank you that disappointment is broken. God, that you are greater. Lord, that you are greater. You are greater. We stand. The testimony of Jesus is a spirit of prophecy. And you've done it once. You're faithful to do it again and again and again. We thank you that he who began a good work is faithful to complete it in Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you, God. We call forth children, sons, and daughters. God, bring them. Lord, the desires of the heart, the desires of the heart for children, may there be no barren among you. In Jesus' name. something last night it says do not grow weary in well-doing because in due time you will reap if you don't faint if you faint not or if you don't lose heart and I looked up the word faint in the in the Greek and it means to relax just to relax so like when you were when you were talking about that when you're talking about that it was just like it just came alive it's like to relax it's like to to take a step back from fervency, to let disappointment, to let disappointment make a gap between what the Lord says and and what your situation is. Lord and God, I just thank you that you're bridging that gap right now, God, and I thank you that we're going from relaxing to to standing in faith, to contending for the miracle. Lord, I thank you that we will not be relaxed. Lord, that we will not let up until we see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. God, I thank you, Lord, that you are faithful to complete the work you've started. And every seed, Lord, I speak to every seed. And I say, come forth. Do what you're created to do. We don't serve an inferior architect. God didn't design you inferior. He didn't design you not to work. When he commanded, he said, be fruitful and multiply. He didn't tease you. That was not a tease. 
And I thank you, Lord, for the testimonies that will come and the children that will come. Don't relax. Don't relax. Do not grow weary. Don't relax. Jesus. Come on, let's give God a hand clap of praise. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Come on. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, children are a reward from the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.